Welcome to the Cabin of Horrors, where we let our inner killers out to play. I am your host, the Incredible Josh. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in to the first episode of I'm really excited to have this platform to connect with all of the amazing fans in the horror community, give my insights on different things in horror, whether it be news, uh, castings, and just, you know, shoot the shit on horror. Now, if this is your first time finding me, you can also check me out, The Incredible Josh, on Instagram, where I host polls on weekly horror movies. I share more reviews and insights on different horror movies and events and news, and I share opinions about everything horror-related. So come stop by my Instagram, The Incredible Josh, and say hi. Speaking of which, I actually recently polled my Instagram followers for what kind of topics they'd like to hear on upcoming episodes of the podcast. Want to make sure that I'm giving the people what they want. You request it, you get it. And surprisingly, there was actually an overwhelming amount of people who wanted to hear more about me and why and how I got into horror. So I figured I would share a little bit about my beginnings into the horror genre and what really brought me to where I am at today. Now, it all started for me when I was about seven years old. I was living in Mississauga, Ontario, and I visited the Port Credit Public Library. <laughs> Does anyone remember libraries? Like, is that still a thing? Do, do, do people still go to libraries now in the age of the internet? You see, growing up, I, I wasn't from a fortunate family. Uh, we didn't have cable for much of my childhood, so the library was literally my blockbuster. <laughs> it's, uh, it's where I first really got introduced to movies in general. I had the opportunity to watch so many classic movies that I, re- I still love today. I still watch to this day, and to me, they stand the test of time. Nostalgia, all all of that kind of stuff. Uh, one of those movies was the, the 1978 classic horror movie, Halloween. Uh, no, it's one of the most popular. It's got to be the top slasher franchise, if not the best slasher franchise ever developed and created. Uh, I, I actually remember the moment vividly. It was resting atop a shelf amongst a variety of other VHS tapes and it had its bold white text over the spine. And I saw it immediately and I loved Halloween itself, right? It's when you get candy and when you get to dress up and have a whole bunch of fun. So... The title itself also drew me in. Now, uh, my mom was very much into horror movies as well, and Halloween was actually one of her favorites, so she let me watch it. When I first watched it, I wasn't scared. Like, it's not a movie that has actually scared me at any point from the first time I viewed it till now. Even when I was young, I I had a really good uh, way of separating fiction from reality. What I really loved about the movie was the fact that the killer didn't need a face, didn't need to say anything in order to be terrifying. Right? He didn't need to scream out. He didn't need to say words that were scary. He just had to have a presence. It was a presence more than anything, which is what drew me into it to begin with. When, when I was a kid and I first saw the Halloween movie, I was fascinated by Michael Myers. I'd, I'd rewatch the movie countless times, hoping that I, I'd f- end up finding some kind of moment where he might make a peep or speak in some way. I was, I was fascinated over the fact that there was a character in general, not even just the killer, a character in general who can be portrayed in the movie as a terrifying presence and doesn't have to say a word doesn't even say a word at any point. I, I, I was blown away how they were able to create that killer and had it so emotionless and blank and creepy and terrifying all wrapped up in one amazing package. Uh, not to mention that there wasn't really no motive to the killings. Eventually, I know, lore was added to the franchise. You know, Halloween 2 with her, Laurie Strode being Michael's sister, and then the Curse of the Thorn, all that kind of stuff. I know the lore was eventually added, but the first movie didn't have any lore. There was no, there was nothing in the movie that identified he is breaking out of this mental asylum to go and kill his family. There was, there was nothing. It was just a crazy masked maniac who broke out of an insane asylum and then started terrorizing his hometown on Halloween night on the anniversary that he first killed his sister. Like, that's, as a general premise, that's fucking terrifying, right? Like, just having that as a premise for a horror movie alone is absolutely terrifying. You don't need anything else. <laughs> that's that's the recipe for slasher success, which is why it will forever remain one of my absolute favorite slasher series of all time. Um, despite the fact that I've actually never seen Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, I still have to, I know, I've said that many times to my Instagram followers, but eventually I will watch Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, and I will actually share that with everybody, um, share my thoughts and my reviews. So that's that's really where horror began for me, was, was the Halloween franchise, the first Halloween movie. Uh, once I'd seen it, I, I needed to see more, right? It drew me into the horror genre. I wanted to learn more about the different horror killers and just, just watch more 
more horror movies. So I, I did. I, I branched off into classic slasher flicks, right? I, I watched Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Scream, you know, all, all of the classic and cult iconic horror movies. I, that's, that's what I started with. That's, that's what I watched. Cause those were really all the only ones I knew, right? I didn't know about B movies. I didn't know about the underground kind of horror movies that not many people knew about that were our cult classics, but eventually now as a, as an adult, I'm there, right? So I've stayed really in the slasher genre for a long time. I, I love slasher movies. I try and stay away from paranormal and possession movies because in, in all honesty, they freak me the fuck out <laughs> like beyond belief only movie to this day. And I, and I'm serious when I say it is the only only movie that has ever shook me to my core and terrified me was The Exorcist. That movie traumatized me as a child. Absolutely scared me. And to this day, I am still afraid of being possessed. And I cannot watch a possession movie without some strike of fear or level of terror in my body every time I watch a possession movie. So I, I not that I'll, I don't watch them because I do, but I try to stay away from them because I don't want to be that terrified. It just feels so real to me. Possession movies just feel too real to me, um, you know, outside of slasher flicks and things like that. The Exorcist instilled the fear in me of demons, ghosts, all that kind of stuff. All right, now to the slaying. So today's episode, we're actually going to be talking about 90s horror movies and the impact that they still have on the horror genre today. Now, there's no question that 90s was a great decade for horror, right? Many movies from the decade are still referenced throughout pop culture and their influence can be seen in modern horror movies to this day. But one of the most iconic and controversial movies of the decade by far has to be The Blair Witch Project. The Blair Witch Project, if you've never heard about it, you've never seen it, it's a story of three student filmmakers who go hiking in the back hills to film a documentary on a local legend, The Blair Witch. No, this movie released right on the cusp of the millennium. So it released in 1999. And when it released, it cost around 750 grand for them to make. It ended up making close to $250 million across the world. Not bad for a horror movie, right? Now, not only was the movie wildly successful, right? A lot of people loved it, but also a lot of people hated it. Despite what your thoughts are on the Blair Witch Project, it is 100% responsible for establishing the found footage subgenre in horror. We would not have the found footage movies like Paranormal Activity that we have today, you know, VHS, all that kind of, all those movies. We wouldn't have them today without Blair Witch. And even if we did, it would not be the same. And that's really what the appeal surrounding this movie came from, right? It was the first of its kind. There, there really wasn't any other found footage horror movies out there in 1999 or before then, right? They weren't a thing in the 90s. And because of that, a lot of people believe the Blair Witch was a real movie. That it was, it was a phenomenon for the longest time that people were bought into it. People honestly believed that it wasn't just a movie, that it was a true story. It was a real documentary and that these people were in danger. And, and the thing about it is, is uh, despite the footage itself looking very legitimate, the marketing team behind the movie didn't really do anything <laughs> to uh, kind of put the fire out surrounding that because they launched the film's official website in June 1998. And the website had fake police reports reports and newsreel style interviews that was surrounding these missing students. And there was tons of questions from their friends, family, people in the community about where they went, you know, what were they doing? What, what is the Blair Witch? That kind of thing. And it looked all so real, especially in 1999, right? Because the internet's still fresh. People aren't expecting this. They're, they're not subjected to fake news yet. So seeing this kind of stuff immediately, they're like, wait, this seems like a real thing. The thing is, is that these also augmented the film's found footage device to spark debates across the internet, right? So a lot of people thought that it was real but also a lot of people thought it was fake. So there was this huge debate when the movie came out on whether it was real or not. And then during the screening, so when they first filmed it at the Florida Film Festival, the filmmakers made advertising efforts to promulgate the events in the film as factual. So they gave away flyers at festivals like Sundance, things like that, asking viewers to come forward with any information they had about the missing students. So doing things like that, great. That is, that is, that's really, you could even probably say the start of viral marketing in a sense. It's a great marketing tactic, right? A great way to get more people to talk about your movie and spread the word that this is going to be something that you don't want to miss, right? Especially if you think it's real. People want that. People want realism in their movies 
And they also want to be able to question it. They want to have questions on whether it is actually real or whether it's fake. Now, the, the campaign tactic was that viewers were actually being told through the missing persons posters that the characters were missing while researching in the woods for the Blair Witch. And then if you went to the IMDb page, it listed the actors as missing presumed dead. <laughs> You can't get any better than that in really trying to hammer the fact that this was real and really create this, this overall feeling surrounding the movie that what you're about to watch is going to be absolutely terrifying. And then question, do you even want to watch this movie? Is it, is it, is it going to terrify you to the point where you're, you're not going to be able to sleep at night? And it's just that those kind of marketing tactics is what really drew a lot of eyes onto the Blair Witch to begin with. And then just, it exploded when people watched it because they, they couldn't tell from the from a found footage whether or not it was actually real or whether it was actually fake um not to mention the film's website actually had materials of actors posing as police and investigators who gave testimony about their casework and then shared childhood photos of the actors so like all of these things just add up to to why this movie was is so not only influential but iconic in the horror genre it was an indie movie that took seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to make it was made through video cameras it wasn't even a professional shoot and it's it's now cemented as the start of the found footage genre and one of the most iconic horror movies in history. And it's needless to say that the movie itself was a hit, right? It made a bunch of bank, still referenced in pop culture with the infamous crying in the tent scene. There were sequels that spawned from it. There was a reboot decades later. Now, I first saw the movie on VHS and I'll admit it got me. I, w I was young. I was one of the people who believed it was actually a real movie. And then they released the sequel, Book of Shadows, and immediately I realized it was all just a movie. <laughs> because Book of Shadows had no realism in it or any sense of reality whatsoever to make it feel like, oh, this, this Blair Witch is actually the real deal. So as soon as that came out, I was like, okay, I agree with all of you. It's not real. Not only does it take talent to make their audience believe something as fact, it takes a lot of talent to literally call out the entire horror genre in a movie and all of its flaws and then still come out on top as one of the most successful horror franchises of all time. We're going to start talking about Scream. We, we can't have a 90s horror movie episode without talking about Scream. In 1996, it came out. Great slasher flick. It's still spawning movies in the franchise to this day. Now, the magic of Wes Craven was definitely not lost here, right? He spawned a new horror icon just at the right time when slashers were, were dead. They had been resorted to torture porn and B-movies at that point, and nobody was interested in a, making even a good slasher movie, and there was none to watch. Now, for those who don't know and have been living under a rock and you don't know what Scream is, it's a story of Sydney Prescott. She's a high school student in Woodsboro, California, who becomes a target of a mysterious killer wearing a Halloween costume. Now, everything about this first movie, and I'm only going to talk about the first movie in the franchise, at least in this episode, but the entire movie was, was unique. The only comment I'll make on the rest of the movies in the franchise franchise is I don't feel the rest of them really captured that same essence that the first movie held. I love most of them. I really do. The first Scream, though, completely revolutionized the horror genre, right? It had satire references from of so many horror movie cliches like Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, and it never shied away from poking fun at its predecessors. It broke the mold completely of horror movies. It was a horror movie that existed within a horror movie. It identified itself as a horror movie situation. The characters were aware of real world horror films and openly discussed them amongst each other. That was one of the first of its kind in the horror genre, right? Horror movies didn't exist in horror movies for the longest time. And the great thing about the first Scream movie was that they actually used that to subvert our attention on who the ghost face killer actually was throughout the first whole movie. Because logically, like, and Randy even said it himself, I should be the killer. <laughs> Right? And, and the first time you watch it, you can't say you didn't think at one point at least that, yeah, you know what? Randy could be the killer. He may be the suspect. And they use that against us to, to subvert our attention to other people and not the actual killers. Now, fun fact about Scream. Did you actually know the original screenplay for Scream was titled Scary Movie? <laughs> Funny because of the movie Scary Movie that was released in complete spoof of it pretty much. Scream actually was the highest grossing slasher film of all time. It made the most money until 2018 when my boy Michael Myers came in with a sequel to the Halloween franchise, took that crown. Needless to say though, Scream pumped a lot of blood into the slasher genre. It was pretty much dead at the time. 
and now Scream 5's been released. It was a massive box office success. They've announced Scream 6. Courtney Cox is coming back as Gail Weathers. There's there's no sign of Ghostface going away anytime soon. His legacy is going to live on. He is a horror icon 100%. Now, actually, speaking of horror icons, there's one horror icon of the 90s that you cannot leave out of a discussion when you're talking about 90s horror movies. It's an icon who terrified the lives of children absolutely everywhere with devilish eyes and an endearing clown costume. That's right, we're about to talk about Pennywise the Clown. Now, the movie It was based off of the Stephen King book, and it was released in 1990 as a psychological drama miniseries that spanned over two episodes. Eventually, it was brought to home video where we all enjoy it now and today. And the miniseries itself was an adaptation and revolved around the predatory monster, It, who can transform himself into the worst fears of his prey. Now, the focus of Pennywise's power revolves around exploiting phobias and bringing out the true fear in his victims. The series followed the book, really, in taking place over two time periods, where a group of kids called the Losers Club confront Pennywise as children in 19. 19- 60, though their attempts really uh, didn't put them away for good despite what they thought and despite their best efforts. The kids then reunite as adults in 1990 when Pennywise resurfaces in their hometown and starts killing kids again. Now, the series itself, it was widely successful, nominated for multiple awards, two Emmy nominations and a win, and it really picked up in popularity because of Tim Curry's portrayal of Pennywise the Clown. And and from then on, you can't deny, he really became the poster child for scary clowns everywhere. You know, the costume and set design itself it was perfect for Pennywise. And it, and it also takes a very talented actor like Tim Curry to, to really embody the character, you know, from his body language to his facial expressions. Everything about his portrayal screams creepy and just absolutely terrifying. And the last thing that, that I'll add about it in general, the miniseries, it didn't need CGI. Can I just say that? Just saying. It was a terrifying, creepy movie with practical effects, a great ending, and good acting. It did not need CGI. That is all I'm going to say about it in general. Now, since we're on the topic also of completely creepy, there's another 90s horror movie that stands itself apart. Now, this movie reached out of the horror genre and touched absolutely everybody and became a staple in pop culture. Whether you liked horror movies or not, you had to watch this movie and you did watch this movie. This came out in 1991 and viewers were treated to a very unique tale of a young FBI trainee hunting a serial killer named Buffalo Bill who skins his female victims. Now. In order to catch him, the FBI trainee is going to seek advice from Dr. Hannibal Lecter, who's an imprisoned cannibalistic serial killer. We're talking about Silence of the Lambs, right? We, we it, It's a 90s horror movie. It's obviously iconic, not only in horror, but in pop culture. The movie is always talked about, always referenced. Was And it's also one of the six horror movies that have ever been nominated for a Best Picture, alongside Exorcist, Jaws, uh, Sixth Sense, Black Swan, and Get Out. It's one of the greatest and most influential films of all time, and really, who could argue? In the years following its release, The Silence of the Lambs was really subject to a lot of criticism regarding, you know, themes of human sexuality, sexual politics. Throughout the film, Clarice's gender was really emphasized. It it was a distinguishing feature as really she's a minority amongst all of the male peers around her. The movie itself is definitely iconic. It's one of my favorite horror movies of all time. The way Anthony Hopkins portrays the character of Hannibal Lecter is creepy and a thing of nightmares. The guy can, can act his way out of a paper bag. He is absolutely incredible. He took a character and made it an icon and continues to terrify all of us to this day. All you need to do is that and you're immediately terrified. Personally, I think Silence of the Lambs is a great movie, one of my favorites. If you haven't seen it, definitely one that you should add to your list and check out. Now, there's one more movie we're going to be talking about on today's episode. Surprisingly, I've I've also discovered that not many people actually know about this movie, despite it being a star-studded cast, and there's tons of references about it in pop culture. The movie we're going to talk about is Seven. It's a movie starring Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, and Kevin Spacey. Like I said, it's star-studded, so if you've never heard of it, definitely look it up. You need to check it out. It's a psychological crime thriller where two detectives are on the hunt to track down a serial killer who utilizes the seven deadly sins as the motive for their murders. And the movie itself, it was critically acclaimed. It's a box office success. It, in my opinion, remains one of the best movies in horror and is definitely a cult classic. It was originally released in 1995. It made over $300 million and was the seventh highest grossing film of the year. And the movie itself, it, it really keeps you on the edge of your seat. The, the entire time from from beginning to end. Kevin Spacey himself, 
regardless of you know what he's done in in outside of his career he he played the role amazing he he played an unpredictable killer in a way that you'll not be able to guess what he's going to do next or what's going to even happen in the story next and if you do guess it you're sitting there with intensity and anticipation waiting for it to happen and it'll just like grab at your throat like the killer's hand it's it's an intense movie o- overall it's great too and it will always leave you the question of asking what's in the box at the end of the movie Now, before we wrap up, I want to give a quick thank you to everyone who took the time to listen to this first episode. It's been really fun. And like I said before, I'm really excited to have a platform where I can connect with each of you. We can have some fun talking about the things that scare and thrill us. I'm looking forward to getting the next episode out to you all. And I'd love if you were to give me a follow or subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you're on Instagram, come visit me. I'm the underscore incredible Josh. I have tons of horror content. I'm always posting daily. And I always love somebody to drop into my messages and say hi and let me know if they have any feedback on the show. I love to hear from my viewers and I love to hear what you have to say and what you think of the show. So if you have any feedback, really send me a message. I would love to talk to you about it. Thank you again for listening to the first episode and we'll be back again soon with episode two.